I've a number of colleagues here at the Wilson Center. It's really my distinct pleasure to welcome you all today to our discussion entitled Strengthening Health Systems to Reach the Poor. Um, I think as many of you know, and in fact I see some veterans of some of these discussions before in the audience, um, this is uh, at the Wilson Center our uh, really raison d'etre to get the best of research together with the best of policy and practitioners and have these two worlds learn from one another. The Wilson Center is actually the formal memorial to President Wilson and is our only president who had a PhD. Congress, when they set up the center in 1968, felt it was appropriate to have a living memorial where these two worlds could come together and learn from one another and improve each other's endeavors. The Environmental Change and Security Program has been tackling the kind of connected issues of health, environment, development, and put them in some cases even in foreign policy and security policy contexts. We've been doing that since 1994 uh, with convening sessions like this, putting together publications, some of which I hope you will pick up outside, um, and trying to, again, provide this in the nonpartisan, non advocacy setting of the Wilson Center the opportunity. Uh, for these exchanges. This meeting, like many that uh, we have uh, sponsored by the Environmental Change and Security Program, is made possible with the general support from USAID and also, it's, uh, of course, resources are critical, but really um, uh, intellectual input is critical as well. And in this case, my Hijazi has been terrific uh, in kind of for years now discussing issues, particularly around health and equity and poverty questions. And we've had some, uh, a number of series on this. And again, I see some folks who participate in those. So it's terrific to see my and a number of our colleagues here today to, to, to join this discussion. And we appreciate you coming in midsummer. We, in fact, had, when, when one puts together a work plan, we'd actually thought about this meeting for May. Um, but we really had two people that we wanted to have come with us, and schedules being what they are, usually when rooms are available here is the biggest impediment. But we, we needed to wait until July, and so it's terrific that you can join us, and it's terrific that we were able to bring uh, Lynn Friedman and Cesar Victoria to the Wilson Center to have this discussion, because as you will see in the bios that we've handed out, they really are people who from different disciplinary backgrounds have spent a lot of time uh, in both the doing world and the studying and analyzing worlds, um, uh, tackling these very important critical issues. And so we're really looking forward to their presentations today to give us some, um, some real fodder for discussion, and we will have that discussion. When we turn to it, I'll ask you to wait um, uh, before posing your question to, for one of my colleagues to bring you a microphone. We're webcasting the event live today uh, on the internet, and we want those folks to be able to hear your questions as well. For our online viewers, I urge you to follow the PowerPoint slides that are on the website as opposed to trying to read it over our speaker's shoulders through the camera here. Uh, you'll find uh, particularly the data tables much easier to read if you look at it that way. Um, I think Cesar Victoria is going to kick us off. He's the Emeritus Professor of Epidemiology at the Federal University of uh, Pelotas in Brazil. Uh, he is currently, and why it's terrific for us, as a resource a little closer by, he's the Fulbright Visiting Professor at the Department of International Health at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And as you can see in the bio, somebody who has um, worked on these issues in, in, the, uh, in the doing world and really written an awful lot about it um, from the analytical world. So it's terrific to have him joining us here today. And Lyd Friedman is the Director of the Averting Maternal Death and Disability Program and of the Law and Policy Project both of which are in the Mailman School's Heilbrunn Department of Population and Family Health at Columbia University. I always thought saying director of the Environmental Change and Security Program at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars <laughs> was a mouthful, but uh, Lynn faces the same challenges. Um, but uh, again, it's a reflection of the distinction of our speakers. Um, so I'm going to turn the floor over and uh, very much look forward to the two presentations. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. I hadn't realized this was a memorial like the other presidential memorials in Washington, uh, some of which I know already. And it's great to be able to come to a memorial and be able to say what you think without uh, having trouble with security. So <laughs> That's right. uh, I'll pick it up from here. Great to be here with Lynn as well. And uh, you'll see we have very different styles. For example, I use slides and she doesn't. Uh, and that reflects our disciplinary backgrounds, too, but I'm pretty sure that we'll come to a lot of uh, common uh, thinking in, in these two presentations. Uh, the reason I'm so concerned about equity is that I live in one of the most inequitable countries in the world. Brazil is consistently rated among the 
10 countries in the world with the widest gaps between rich and poor. We're actually doing a little bit better now where uh, inequities tend to be decreasing over the last 10 years or so, but it's still a massive gap. And as a public health practitioner, as an epidemiologist in Brazil, uh, this uh, led me to, to choose equity as one of the main points of interest. And by working together with international organizations such as uh, UNICEF and WHO, I've been able to uh, carry out equity-related wor uh, work in, in several different countries. And I would just like to start by saying that equity is a very, it's a very broad concept, and I'm sure Lynn will tackle the definitions much better than I do. But the determination of equity has distal determinants such as of social, political, economic environments, which lead to social stratification within a society and social stratification lay, uh, affects child health and nutrition through a number of different pathways. And I just have this little oval here to say this is what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about access to preventive and to curative interventions, which is only one tiny piece of the whole equity scene. So uh, I decided to focus on that because this is where we who work in the health sector and he, we who work in ministries of health in other agencies, that's where we can really uh, make a difference in the short term. So we shouldn't ignore the big picture. This is the big picture, but I'm going to talk about this small piece of the whole, uh, the whole factors that influence equity in health. Also, I'm going to be talking about socioeconomic inequities or wealth inequities. And, and there are many other important types of uh, Inequities. They're inequities by gender, by urban, rural, ethnic group, education. And these inequities interact and overlap with socioeconomic inequities. So it's not to say that socioeconomic inequities somehow are more important than the other types of inequities, but these are the ones I'm tackling for a number of reasons. One of which is that they are much easier to measure now than they used to be in the past. We now have tools that we can incorporate in surveys that will, based on the number of household assets and the type of building people live, we can use some fancy statistical techniques to classify people, usually into five groups or quintiles, starting from the poorest 20% all the way to the richest 20%. And several of my slides will have this type of logic. Now, there's too much information in this slide, so we're going to tackle it line by line. And my question is, based on on work that I've done in many different countries, as well on my own work in Brazil, what are kind of things that countries can do, in particular ministries of health can do, to reduce inequity? The first point, I think, is that we have to recognize that we are part of the problem. The health sector is part of the reason why there are health inequities. It's not the whole picture, but it's a pretty sizable part of the problem. And one slide that I have borrowed from Dave Quatin, who's hiring in the back here today, and if you have any questions about this, I'm sure he'll be happy to answer them. Uh, Dave did a, a review of recent de demographic and health surveys, or DS DHS, in many countries, and he took the average. There are over 50 surveys here. 70 or so, Dave? 70 or so. And here are the poorest and here are the least poor. And this is the proportion of all deliveries that are seen uh, by a skilled birth attendant, somebody who's skilled, who's been trained to deliver a baby and who can perform the basic clean delivery procedures. Uh, first thing you notice is that there's a great difference from Europe and Central Asia, where ev just about everybody is seen by a skilled birth attendant. And South Asia, the, the blue line, where very few people are seen by a birth attendant, except for the least poor. The reason we use least poor here is that in some countries, poverty is so widespread that it's not really, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to speak about the richest, but it's the least poor may be a more appropriate uh, description of this group. So these are primarily dependent on the health system, skilled delivery is primarily dependent on the health system. And the health system is in every country we use, every region we use, and the, each region is, a, is a, a mean of several countries. It is systematically more common among the rich than the poor. And in some, there are great inequities in some, in some regions, 
perhaps smaller inequities in others, like Europe, or just about everybody has a, a, a skilled attendant at delivery, but still the health sector is definitely playing a role here. And if we recognize that, then we're ready to move on and think, how can we uh, help fix this question? The second point is that we have to prioritize diseases of the poor. This is not enough, but it's an essential first step. As part of the countdown to 2015, which is an effort to monitor the MDGs, MDG 4 and 5 particularly, in, in about 70 different countries, we now have pie charts of causes of death for most countries in the world, which is very new. A few years ago, we didn't have that. It's based on new data being collected as well as estimates, procedures, uh, and we now know what children are dying for. And now we know that in most countries of the world, pneumonia accounts for about 20% of deaths, diarrhea for another 20% or so. HIV, this is Mozambique, HIV has a big chunk here, 13%, but in most countries, more like 3 to 5%. Uh, neonatal causes a big uh, chunk as well. So by knowing uh, our distribution, of main causes of death, we can try to do something that Tanzania is now doing, which is our next slide, which is looking at the different programs, such as IMCI, malaria control, safe motherhood, sexually transmitted diseases, and so forth. And the red bar means the disease burden, that is the participation of the diseases addressed by this program in the overall burden of disease in this province, this, this is one, one district in Tanzania, and the green line is how much that's of the total percent of resources that district is spending on IMCI uh, diseases. Here we have the 35 percent of the burden of disease is due to IMCI conditions, and yet only 5 or 7 percent are being spent on it. This is a simplistic graph. You know, some interventions cost more than others, but we go over and over, we go to different places, and we also always find that other diseases that don't account for so much, and they, these may in include cancer, they may include other chronic diseases and so forth, they take up a sizable proportion of the budget, and yet in terms of global burden in that particular region, they are not so big. So again, you know, apologies to the economists in the audience. This is a simplistic chart, but it's the first way of plotting where your resources are going and what is the burden of disease in your region, and then start the discussion. You can't end up spending matching these perfectly because some interventions are more expensive than others, but it's very useful to know where your money is going and what kind of diseases are most prevalent in your situation. And then let's rethink the budget and see if we can do better than that. Third point, and I want to develop this a little bit longer because this is an issue that I'm really interested in, is not all inequities are the same. So there are different patterns of inequities in different societies. And to address that, I made up this index a few years ago called co-coverage. Co-coverage is like we have comorbidity when a child has diarrhea and at the same time develops pneumonia, or has measles and then develops diarrhea, or has HIV and gets TB. So comorbidity is the, the sense that more than one disease is present in the same child at the same time. It also applies to adults, of course. But what we try to do is there's a basic set of nine interventions that every child should get, and these include having safe water, uh, vitamin A, basic vaccines, sleeping under a, a mosquito net treated with insecticide if that child lives in, lives in a malaria area, and so forth. So we just listed those. And for each individual child, we went back to the DHS surveys and to the mix surveys, and we reanalyzed the data and say, okay, out of these nine, how many interventions is this child getting? And then we plotted that by socioeconomic status. And here is our graph again. This is Cambodia in the poorest. And we say, if we wanted to look at the percent of under five children who had all the nine, it was virtually zero in every group except for the least poor. So it was a 
too strict a criterion. You just, you know, having all nine was asking too much. But let's ask, how many of them get six of the nine, okay? And I think this brings a, a good uh, connection to Lynn's talk, I hope, because it's a human right. I mean, getting all these nine interventions is a human right. Every child should have the right to receive the full package. These are available. They are not terribly expensive. They are available in the country. Every child should get them. Now, if you go to Cambodia, you find that everybody gets fairly low coverage, goes up with wealth, and then the rich are well above. Still, they're not doing too well. They're still at 60-something percent, but they're well, well above the rest. Then we go to Brazil. Well, Brazil's different, very different shape. Just about everybody gets 80% or more except for the very poor. And then we ran these analyses for many, many countries. You know, we actually ran them for over 60 countries. I just have a few here to exemplify. Brazil and Nicaragua have the pattern that the rich, everybody else is doing pretty well and the poor are well behind. We call that, for lack of a better word, bottom inequity. Because the bottom group, the poorest group, is clearly different from all the rest. On the other hand, if you go to Haiti, or if you go to Cambodia, or if you go to Bangladesh, it's different. It's top inequity. Most people are doing pretty badly, except the better off. And we think that has important implications for policy and programming, because if you are here you'd really target the poor because everybody else is doing pretty well. You're trying to find those very poor, find where they are, in which districts they live, what is the economic cutoff that you're going to use, and you really do something about them. Now, if you're here, coverage is pretty low except for the very rich. So you really want to disseminate interventions widely so that everybody goes up, including the rich who are not doing too well. And maybe you can do some geographical targeting. You can say, oh, these, these districts are the ones that are not doing so well. Let's help them more than we help the rest. But you're still concerned about raising the whole curve. And if you're in the half, way through, like is the case for Malawi, you can seem to continue to disseminate widely because still even the, the better off are not so doing so well. But you have to give special attention to the poor because we have shown that the trend here is that these will go up and Malawi will, be, will become similar to Brazil and to Nicaragua with the poor remaining behind and everybody going up. So this is almost like a natural history. You start, when you have a new intervention, you start here, the rich pick it up, then it's being picked up by the others, and then everybody picks up except the poor. So we have to know where we are in a country so that we can decide whether or not to target and, and what are the most appropriate ways of uh, improving equity. Very useful distinction, we think. Very easy to do this type of analysis, given that most countries have this kind of survey nowadays. Number five, uh, four. Uh, what can countries do? This is really interesting because these are some real examples of countries that are doing it the right way. Uh, we were involved in Bangladesh in a big evaluation of IMCI. And during that, we worked with lo local counterparts, we worked with the government, and we're really evaluating equity as well as the overall impact of IMCI. And uh, one of our team members, Sham Arifin, who's a principal investigator there, then sat with the government and said, I'm, Bangladesh still doesn't have IMCI. And in the first year they implemented IMCI, 2002. For those of you who don't know, IMCI is Integrated Management of Childhood Illness, which is a WHO UNICEF initiative to reduce uh, mortality due to common causes of this, uh, childhood illness. So, and, and so the first thing we did was to, to get hold of, a, of a, a map here which shows the under five mortality. Red areas being very high mortality, yellow areas, intermediate mortality, green areas, low mortality. And if you look hard enough, you'll find such maps for most countries, if not for mortality, at least for poverty. The World Bank, UNDP have poverty maps for countries. We've been using these a lot in helping uh, develop and deploy interventions. But look at that. In 2002, we had two places with IMCI, two clinics. In 2003, it was still going around the place, some in the yellow area, near the green area, some in the red area. 
in starting 2004, the group said, we have to do better than that. We really have to put these clinics where mortality is highest. That's where we can have a bigger impact. And that's what they did in 2004. Look at that. All in the red area. 2005. All in the red area. 2006. They saturated the red area, and then they started moving to the yellow areas. And by 2006, 148 of the 159 districts in the red areas, in the high mortality areas, had already IMCI. So they could do it. You know, it's not impossible. It takes planning, and it takes political will. Let's look at Brazil now. Uh, this is the northeast of Brazil, and this is infant mortality. Red means high mortality. Uh, Pink means, means intermediate mortality. White means very low mortality. By the way, I live way down here. <laughs> I'm almost out of Brazil. You know, I'm Brazilian. I'm 100 kilometers from the border with Uruguay. So, uh, but anyway, this is the low mortality area of the country. This is high mortality in the northeast mainly and in the Amazon area. Now, let's look what happened with tetravalent vaccine. That's when they put the, the traditional triple bacterial vaccine, uh, diphtheria, tetanus, whooping cough, and they added uh, HIB, or Haemophilus influenza B. So they added a new component, so there was a new vaccine. Look at the red. Red is where the vaccine coverage is very low. It's low in the northeast, it's low in the north, and it's much higher, the green areas being higher coverage mostly in the south. So it's almost like they were putting the vaccine was it wasn't needed. That's what happened. It was going to those kids who needed it least because it's just uh, allowed to disseminate in Brazil. Now this fact, there was no planning. They just let municipalities and state pick up the vaccine and give it to kids. So there's no proactive effort to improve equity. Now, going back to Brazil, uh, let me this is still the mortality map. High mortality in the north, northeast, low in the south. And then the government decided to, to, to implement a new program called the Family Health Program. Basically, primary health care for poor families. And it said, the government said, we're going to do it in the poor regions. We're really going to reach the poor because they need it most. And again, dark green is where the program is. Well, quite a difference. There's no family health where I live. It's all up there. And these are very highly paid teams. They get more. You know, the, my students come out of med school in Brazil, and if they go to work in one of these places, they get better salary than I get as a full professor. You know? So there is a proactive effort. It includes doctors, it includes nurses, it includes community health workers, and it's being deployed exactly in the places where it's most needed. Yeah, there's some exceptions here, okay, you know, it's not perfect, but still there. And, and this program is far, far from being perfect, but it's, it is a, it's, it, there's at least a couple of good evaluations in Brazil showing that they really managed to reduce infant mortality with the program because it was deployed in the hard to reach area and because they were paying to, wish, wishing to pay more because it's hard, it's not easy to live up there. You know, living conditions are not so easy. These are small towns. It's an arid area. It's far away from everything. So it's, it's fair enough that doctors and nurses and community health workers should get better pay for living in these areas. And this is what happened. Now, one more example. Peru is doing some wonderful thinking in terms of vaccines. Look at what they did. They introduced a pentavalent vaccine, which in addition to all I told you before, also has the hepatitis B vaccine in it. And it was first introduced in 40% of the country in the poorest districts. So they only started the vaccine, was only available in the poorest districts. And after four years, they reached universal coverage because they moved it on to the better off places. So now they have very high coverage. Peru does very well in vaccinations. But it started in the opposite way as Brazil did. Brazil made it available in the richest district and eventually hoped that it would trickle down to the poor district. Peru did the other use the reverse logic. Rotavirus vaccine against diarrhea is being introduced now this year to 20% of the population again in the poorest district. And they now want to introduce a pneumococcal vaccine in the same pattern. So it was a, a policy, high level policy decision. Let's start where diarrhea is more common. Let's start where pneumonia is more common. And these are the poorest districts. So it also makes sense 
in terms of preventing disease. Two more things before I finish. Employ the appropriate delivery channels. A delivery channel is a way of getting a vaccine or an antibiotic or a vitamin supplement to the population. You can make these available in hospitals, and only people who come live close to a hospital will get them. You can make them available in health centers, and people who live close to a health center will get them. But you can also try harder to make them available in the community. And this is a picture I took in Benin a couple months ago about a community case management a program that is supported by UNICEF, which means that community health workers like this guy here are trained in diagnosing pneumonia using very simple methods, and he has the antibiotics needed for that. It's, you know, in many countries, this faces terrible opposition from the medical bodies, and I'm sure Lynn will talk about that too, and because they say, oh, community health workers can't give antibiotics. Doctors should give antibiotics because they're properly trained. But there are lots of studies, a lot of very good data uh, uh, in different studies showing that this works and this reduces mortality with very few side effects. So this is one way of ensuring that the antibiotics get to the kids who live in this community who would not get them otherwise. Uh, critical issue. Remove financial barriers. Many countries set up user fees, mainly 10, 20 years ago, and they decided it was a good idea to charge people for coming to a health center because people were paying for health care elsewhere, so why not charge them as well? I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an idea that didn't really work out. I know this is a hot topic for discussion here, but I have a, a graph from Dave here that whenever I show that, Dave, I get criticized. But since you're here, maybe you can deal with the criticism. We took 50-something. I was a co-author in this analysis. We took 50-something countries with DHS. And we look, where are the poorest skin tile, the poorest 20% of the children getting treatment? And the red bars mean public sector. So... Of children who had ARI, or acute respiratory infection, and went to, for medical treatment, doesn't mean a medical doctor, it could be any kind of, a, of, of, of provider. 25%, look at the scale, it's not a whole lot. You know, 25% went to the public sector, about 8% to the private sector. Skill delivery, 25%, 5%. So in every variable we studied, and we studied several variables, the poor were getting care more from the public than from the private sector. This is very controversial, okay? There's a whole definition, what is the private sector, what is the public sector? But what we wanted to highlight is, this is a sort of issue that countries have to consider when they are planning to institute user fees. It's not only how much money they'll be making, and how much they'll be recovering from the cost, but also what's gonna happen to the poor and this kind of analysis suggests that the poor are still primarily getting care from the public sector. If you charge here, you may affect them. You're likely to affect the poor much, to a much greater extent than you affect the better off. Now, last point. I think we're completing the whole cycle here. We talked about planning, prioritizing, deploying services, and now we go to monitor and valuation. It's very easy to go out and do a, an evaluation and say, oh, mortality reduced by so much, or coverage increased by so much. But we should also ask, yes, but what happened to the poor? What happened to inequities? Because you can, as Dave Gwatkin has shown, you can reach the MDGs by preferentially increasing coverage and reducing mortality among the rich. You can, you can reach the overall MDG, but the poor will be left behind. And this is an example of something we're just completing now in Mali, it's an evaluation of a UNICEF program uh, known as ACSD, and we have ACSD districts, we had comparison districts in blue, before and after. So if you look at before ACSD was implemented, this is the proportion of the poorest who had three or more antenatal care visits. Quite a lot of inequities, you know, 50% in the better off, still low. I mean, everybody should get that, but about 10% in the poor. And this is the comparison district. 20% here, 60 here, 
about the same pattern, not very different. Well, after the program, this is what happened in the ACSD area. They had a number of uh, community-based um, strategies for reaching the poorest, and they did. The poorest improved much more than the rich did. And in the comparison areas, it just it improved a little bit overall, but every point moved up. If anything, the poor uh, had less progress than, than, the, than the other groups. But it shows how you can fairly easily incorporate equity considerations in a program. And I've shown you here a success story. A lot of what we did, even in the ACSD program, wasn't so good. But I mean, this is an example where you could increase coverage and at the same time reduce inequities. Okay. So back to my first slide. These are some things and some examples of things that may be done in practical terms within the health sector to reduce inequities in health. And I would like to finish with this slide, which is about you know, how, how, many, how can you afford to have your life saved. Thank you very much. I should just keep this slide up, but uh, maybe. <laughs> Can I just close this, maybe? How, how would that work? Well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, many thanks to uh, Jeff and the Woodrow Wilson Center and to our friends in USAID for helping make this event happen. And it's always a great pleasure to uh, be with Cesar and have the chance to discuss with him and interact, and I hope with all of you, too. Um, if, if you came here um, expecting some kind of debate between the two of us, I have to say that I'm sorry to disappoint, because for the most part, I actually agree with virtually everything Cesar said. And so um, rather than repeat many of the same things, I thought I would try to show you in a way why I think public health is really a very rich field that can and should entertain many different perspectives for coming at the same problems. So um, even though I am a professor of public health and I very often do use slides and do use many of the, even some of the same slides Cesar was using, I decided today that I would play the um, lawyer, human rights advocate to Cesar's epidemiologist. And uh, in the world today, that often means that you don't use slides. So I decided not to. So um, for the people online, apologies. No, um, but I thought I would speak today from fundamentally a human rights perspective. And I don't mean the chapter and verse of different treaties but basically speak from a perspective about values. And so addressing this question of strengthening health systems to reach the poor and to have as the kind of fundamental starting point the basic human rights values of individual dignity, um, structural equality, equity, and the whole dynamic of accountability, the dynamic of obligation and, and entitlement. So Cesar um, outlined some of the key policy priorities that the evidence shows a Ministry of Health can and should think about and incorporate in their planning, implementation, and monitoring. But here's the question. How do we make those policy priorities actually work? I think, in fact, the field is littered, in a way, with good ideas and good intentions that look good on paper, and maybe they've even worked in a country, and there's been an impact evaluation, and we have good data that they work, 
but they don't necessarily work in the next place that tries to import it. Why not? Why is it that we can't just take one country, prove that something works, and have a formula for doing it in the next country? Well, some of it Cesar showed you, such as the different patterns of inequality, what I think WHO has called the massive deprivation versus the marginal exclusion patterns. So that's part of the reason. But I also think um, we should ask, um, what about the ways we actually understand poverty and what it is? The ways we understand what a health system actually is and how it works. What about those ways of understanding and thinking enables us to implement these kinds of interventions that Cesar showed you so that they do, in fact, reach the poor? And not just reach the poor, but address poverty. So we have some quite traditional ways to think about the relationship between poverty and health. The usual ways um, include, for example, the capabilities approach of Amartya Sen, that um, the reverse of poverty, health, is intrinsically valuable Good health is intrinsically valuable, and that's part of what poverty reduction is about. It's not just about your um, economic position. It's about good health, education, and the ability to reach your capabilities. And so that's an intrinsic value. We often talk about the instrumental value of poverty reduction. So, for example, the big problem of catastrophic healthcare costs. I mean, at different times, WHO has estimated that something like 100 million people a year are pushed below the poverty line by catastrophic healthcare costs. So that's a very important connection between poverty and health. I want to focus on actually a somewhat different way of thinking about it that I think of as being at fundamentally the way we in both human rights and public health should be approaching this question of how to strengthen health systems um, to reach the poor. So first, how do we understand poverty? I would argue that poverty is not just about deficit. It's not just about what you don't have. You don't have money, you don't have food, you don't have education even. But that poverty is fundamentally relational. It's about interactions with structures of power. I think that we, we do have data, such as the Voices of the Poor studies that the World Bank did in the year 2000, which really showed when they asked people about what it means to be poor, what really came through is it's not just what you don't have, but rather things like neglect, abuse, voicelessness, exclusion. These are all part of the very experience of what it means to be poor today. And that's not just in poor countries. I mean, certainly if we think about what it means to be poor in America today, it includes things about these interactions with different structures of power, not least of which, of course, is the health system. But if we think about poverty in these kinds of power relations terms, um, we see immediately why, for example, Cesar's very first point is really critical, and that is the point about what we sometimes call intersectionality, that it's never just about not having money. It's always some kind of intersection that includes things like gender, race, um, and other aspects of social disadvantage. So when we think about poverty, we need to think about those things. And I think we need to think critically about this question of interaction with structures of power. And then how do we think about health systems? What are health systems? Well, I would argue that a health system is not just 
a mechanical delivery system for delivering interventions, the way a post office delivers a letter, right? The government system for doing that. But rather a health system is part of the very fabric of social and civil life. The health system, the way it operates, the way it interacts with a population actually transmits the state's values, whether we're talking about the public health system or the private health system. Whether when we talk about exclusion from that system, it transmits the values of the state. And so I often argue that health systems are actually core social institutions. And I often say when I speak to public um, human rights groups, just like a judicial system or a police system or a prison system is a key social institution in the country that you're concerned about, if we think about the way most people deal with life and death, the health system is a key social institution and by human rights people, as well as public health people, should be addressed that way. And therefore, if we put these two together, this view of poverty and this view of health systems, I think we can say that neglect and abuse and voicelessness in the health system is part of the very experience of being poor today. Again, in this country as well as in poor countries. But I think the converse is also true. The health system can neglect, abuse, and make people poor in this sense, but I also believe that the health system is a key place for asserting citizenship rights. And therefore, the, the health claims, the ability to make a claim for care and have it addressed, have it met, the kinds of claims Cesar was talking about and many more, that that itself is an asset of citizenship in a democratic society, the ability to make a health claim and have it met. And so we should think of health systems in that sense as a building block of a democratic society. So what does it mean then to take the question of the day, of the afternoon, of the two hours, uh, what does it mean to strengthen a health system to deal with these kinds of power relationships that I would argue define poverty, is one definition of poverty. And I'm going to just use one example um, and, and make sure we uh, leave time for questions here from the maternal health field. And I think I, I think it's important that in addition to speaking about child health, we also talk about maternal health and specifically maternal mortality. Because in a way, this is where the question of strengthening health systems is really very challenging. And in that sense, it's different, I think, from a vaccine program or even um, community-based programs like the um, some of what Cesar showed you here. When we speak about maternal mortality, and that's I'm going to take that piece of maternal health, maternal mortality, I really think we have to think of the health system as a whole, as the home to hospital continuum of care. Often what we're talking about a district level local health system. And I'll, I'll make one little digression to say that tonight on PBS, on Wide Angle at 9 o'clock, turn your tune in, there, there's going to be a special called Birth of a Surgeon. And we can come back to this, which is about a program in Mozambique to train midwives to do cesarean sections. And it's on tonight uh, on PBS. And following the show, there's a... Um, interview with Margaret Chan. And I, I, we just did a premiere of this yesterday at Columbia, so I happened to see it yesterday um, and encourage everyone to watch it tonight. So Margaret Chan is the Director General of WHO. And in it, she says very explicitly what many people agree, that maternal mortality is actually a surrogate for a functioning health system. 
So she says, you know, if, if you follow maternal mortality, in many ways you're following what happens with a health system. And if it can work for women for that purpose, it can work for men, she says. But I, I think this is right, and this is a reason why it's, I think, helpful to bring maternal mortality here. So what does it mean to strengthen a health system? Well, there's certainly, I, I would certainly agree, there's a technical challenge. All the technical pieces of a health system needs to be in place. And sometimes I have this argument with human rights people that rights are great and talking about accountability is great, but we need always to have the technical pieces in place and that itself is a human right. So I would say we, we can take something like the WHO's new framework for strengthening health systems and just to give you a sense of what I'm talking about, uh, mean things like health services. These are the building blocks of the WHO health strengthening, health system strengthening framework. Health services, the health workforce, health information system, medical products, vaccines, technologies, health financing, leadership and governance. Those are the different building blocks that WHO is now using as its framework for action for strengthening health systems. One of the interesting things about them is that they are devoid in a way of values. They're, they're neutral in a sense. They are building blocks of a health system. And what I would argue is that they have to be underlined by values. So what does it mean to have leadership or, or uh, governance you can have good governance in a system that's totally inequitable. I mean, in a technical sense. I would argue it's bad governance if it doesn't improve equity, and that's what I mean by putting a value to it. So let me um, take one example that I think is now really critical from the maternal mortality field um, and put it out there and ask the question of whether this example strength health, strengthens health systems to reach the poor. Um, there's a lot of interest in the world these days in um, cash transfers to strengthen health systems. And in demand side financing, results-based financing, there are different kind of pieces of this general approach of using money and the way it flows to try to improve the functioning of a health system. So I want to just take an example from India that's, I think, um, being uh, used a lot or talked about a lot in, in global circles today that I think challenges us on this issue. So India has a, a big new program, I think it launched in 2005, called the National Rural Health Mission. And the NRHM is really an attempt to address um, rural poverty in rural areas with the health system. And as part of this, a centerpiece is what, what is called the JSY scheme, Janani Suraksha Yojana, JSY scheme. And the JSY scheme is supposed to address the basic problem of in India, as in most countries, you have inequity in maternal mortality, and there's higher maternal mortality amongst the poor and marginalized. Amongst the poor and marginalized, there's very low utilization of services, and there's also a very high level of home deliveries. So the JSY scheme is a key part of the National Rural Health Mission. And what the JSY does is it pays, it recognizes that for low utilization, money is one of the barriers. Perhaps not the only barrier, but one of the barriers. So the JSY scheme is pretty simple. It pays a poor woman 
a small amount of money, which is actually a lot of money in India, uh, about 700 rupees. It, it varies in different states, but about 700 rupees, about $12 or so these days. Um, to a woman who goes to an institution to deliver. And it pays about 600 rupees to a community health worker. The new community health workers in, they're actually volunteers in India, are called ashas. So it pays this community worker about 600 rupees, about $10, for bringing the woman to the facility to have an institutional delivery. So this program, how is it working? What are the early results? This has had an incredible impact on institutional delivery. Almost overnight in public health terms, so in the space of a year, a year and a half, in many states, institutional delivery rates have skyrocketed. Um, they've come close to doubling in some places. The states are delighted. I think people are reporting this as a huge success. And I, I've heard it talked about in different parts of Africa as, as a uh, really model program for demand side financing. It's clearly reaching the poor. You have literally hundreds of thousands more people who are reached by this program. But is it addressing poverty? And that's the question I put out of, to you. Is it strengthening the health system as a core social institution and addressing poverty? I think it's also important to ask, is it improving safe delivery? Because really, the question is one about health systems, about not just demand, not just reaching the poor, and changing demand, but we also need to be looking at supply. How is this system functioning to provide services for people? And I would say the anecdotal evidence early on is that it's a very mixed bag. Let me put out some of the kinds of things we've been hearing about how this is going. So. One, there's some level of corruption, and I'm not even going to speak much about that because I think in any new program, that can happen and it needs to be addressed and, and problems with uh, the money not being paid and so on to different individuals is, is something that you know a new program needs to look at and I think the Indian government is trying to look at it. Um, but I, I think there are bigger kinds of problems. So what does it mean to just increase institutional delivery? This is the kind of anecdotal evidence. I was recently in India with the UN Special Rapporteur on the, on the right to health, and we heard these kinds of anecdotal stories about what's going on. So people below the poverty line can be paid about $10, a lot of money in India to, for a, to go to an institution to deliver. So I heard stories from rural Maharashtra, for example, that um, a woman would go into labor, where this is a place where people almost always deliver at home. So a woman goes into labor, and her husband wants to get the payment from the JSY scheme. So when she goes into labor, she walks two hours to the nearest health facility. In many cases, this is just a couple rooms without a skilled attendant or any other um, uh, ability to treat complications of pregnancy. She gives birth, she receives the payment, and two hours later, bleeding, she walks home two hours, and the husband gets the money. So this is an example of some of what's happening. In other cases, the scheme may be working very well, and people are going to facilities that can actually treat complications and perhaps 
um, address maternal death. But I think this is an example um, of where a very specific scheme has narrowed its attention to one issue, in this case, institutional delivery, in a system that has not actually addressed the supply side. So it has not actually dealt with the whole range of power and other problems that make it so that in many parts of India, there are no institutional delivery services. There are no skilled birth attendants in the facilities. There is no capacity at the place where women are being asked to deliver to address the complications that could kill her. And this is where all the kinds of issues like the power of the professional societies to prevent other people, other levels of health workers from being trained to uh, provide life-saving care. This is where these issues come in, issues like absenteeism. Um, in parts of India, something like 40% of healthcare workers are simply not there in the health facilities. So there's a whole, in the health facilities where they are posted and where they're supposed to be. So all of these kinds of power issues are out there. Well, this um, JSY scheme is being talked about as a way of reaching the poor, as a huge success because it's getting poor women into institutions for delivery. But the problem is we're not looking at either, we're just looking at institutional delivery, and we're not looking at the whole range of dynamics that makes a health system function. In the case of India, and in the case of this national rural health mission, I'm actually optimistic, because I think what we are seeing in India is a program like this that starts in one way. There's also a whole um, structure to engage people and civil society groups in ways of trying to monitor and hold the program accountable. So where did we hear these stories? We didn't hear these stories just from women. We heard stories about the way the program is functioning from civil society groups, from groups who are actually working with the Ministry of Health, with commissions on women's affairs, and so on, to hold public hearings, to um, in other ways begin to monitor and address these programs. So I think when we are talking about um, strengthening the health system to reach the poor. We're talking not just about what the ministry can do, although that's critical, but we're talking importantly about what civil society can do, what people can do to hold the system accountable for actually doing more than simply reaching the poor but actually addressing these kinds of underlying dynamics of poverty. And that, I think, is what we mean when we talk about strengthening health systems to reach the poor, not just reaching them, but addressing poverty. And that, I think, is the fundamental challenge that we have today. So I'm gonna end there. Give us time for questions. Terrific. thank you very much. Well, thank you both. I think you're absolutely right. The, the different styles, different presentations, but really coming together in very complementary ways to give us lots of avenues for discussion. As I mentioned as we opened, uh, we are broadcasting this live on the web, so we ask that you, uh, if you'd like to pose a question, let us know who you are, and then also if you could use the microphones that one of my colleagues will bring to you. Um, then we'll, folks online will be able to hear it as well. So why don't we start with the gentleman there, and then we'll go to the back. 
Hi, my name is Alexander Hurdle Fernandez. I'm with the Roosevelt Institution. Um, obviously, the dialogue has focused thus far just on developing countries, but I was wondering if you could shed some light on the situation in the United States, particularly in light of the, some startling statistics that show that infant mortality and maternal mortality are experiencing a resurgence, especially amongst poor communities in the South um, that have been traditionally vulnerable and disadvantaged. Okay, why don't we take a couple and then give you guys an opportunity. So, ma'am, in the back. Okay. Yes, my name is Yvonne Ferguson, and I work for World Vision. And I'm very happy that Miss um, Friedman raised the supply side issues in her presentation because I'm sitting here and I'm wondering um, access to what kind of healthcare, and I'm wondering at what point we'll raise the quality issues. Because I mean, in the example that you gave, um, the women do go to the institution for delivery. But are they attended by a skilled birth attendant? What is the attitude? What is the skill level? Are they familiar with the latest um, whatever techniques in safe delivery, etc.? What is the quality of care that they receive? And I'm saying this with a, as someone who has actually watched my mother die helplessly in Ghana, and she wasn't a poor client because the doctor who attended her being the most skilled cancer doctor in Ghana, still didn't know she had actually given her an overdose for her chemotherapy, and she died. So I think the issues, there are some things that both poor and rich clients receive, and that's poor quality care. And I'm wondering at what point, you know, in the discussion that we can introduce that and see how, what countries can do to improve that. Thank you. Terrific, why don't we take those two and give you a chance to respond to those. And I'm not an expert in the USA, but I, I live in a country that is much poorer than the USA, in which in 1998, uh, uh, the new constitution which was passed after the military dictatorship was, went away, uh, it, the, the, there's a, a, a specific, uh, one of the, the key principles of the constitution health is the right of all and the duty of the state. And therefore, we, had a, we set up a national health system and I think we're, we're now, which is universal, everybody can use it. Uh, quality is not often the best, that's true. Uh, but if you look at Brazil now, Brazil is one of the countries where uh, the MDGs are being met easily. Uh, you know, our infant mortality now is, is under 20 per thousand, down from 40 just uh, 10 years ago. Uh, malnutrition in Brazil is very rare now. We're actually tackling obesity, which is the other end of the, ex uh, the extreme. And I mean, I'm definitely not an expert in USA, but I find it hard to understand that such a big country cannot provide uh, good care to all of its citizens. And if you look at the international statistics, I don't have to, you only have to go outside to a movie theater and watch a Michael Morris film, <laughs> yeah, which is a, obviously, it's a, it's a, it's a bit of anecdotal in many parts. And, but the point is made, the health statistics in this country are way below what they should be given the country's wealth. Uh, and when you plot wealth versus infant mortality, for example, you get a more a straight line if you use a, the log scales and everything. And the U.S. is a clear outlier there, having lots of wealth and high mortality. Uh, Brazil's a bit of an outlier, too. Uh, but, we're, uh, but I think, uh, uh, you know, it's... it's it's, it's hard to understand for someone who comes from outside how such a rich country cannot provide quality health care. And maybe Lynn, I know Lynn knows the situation much better than I do, but just before I give a, a pass a mic to her, the other question is very, very important one. Uh, in, uh, you know, and let me go back to Brazil again. Even within the national health system, which does provide care to everyone, uh, we have just done some analysis and we note that the poor get worse care than the rich, even though everybody's entitled and they don't have to pay anything. But it's a whole issue of a, a interaction between a doctor and a patient. You know, if you're, if you're rich and educated and you know how to access the doctor and describe your conditions in a way that the, the doctor becomes perceptive and treats you better than the same doctor will treat somebody else, even though the, you know, the, there's no financial incentives for the doctor to treat you better. Than, so, you know, wealth is an issue, but there are other cultural issues that also influence. And I'm also aware of studies from Cuba showing the same thing, that the educational level of the patient affects the quality of care even within a nationalized system. So it's really more, it's a pretty complex issue. 
Cesar, can I ask a question just before we go on that first one? When you ran your co-coverage analysis, was the United States, did you do that? No, for? well, the, no. I, well, that would be great. I, I wonder if I could get the data to do that. You need the individual level data, but I know that vaccine vaccination rates, for example, in many, US, uh, many parts of the U.S. are well below those in, in some developing countries. So it would be interesting to see what happens. I'm sure that in the U.S. you have this sort of bottom inequity pattern in which, you know, the South, uh, the minorities and, and these uh, special groups will be well behind the rest. Mm -hmm. But it would be interesting. I don't, I don't know if anybody ever did that. Mm -hmm. Well, I, w I wish I could say I was an expert on this system in this country and understood it better than I do. The one thing I, I, I do know very well is that this is uh, one of the very few, if not the only country in the world that does not accept social, economic, and cultural rights as actual human rights. So in our legal system, we actually don't, do not think of health not think. The law does not recognize health, education, or many other um, things that in international human rights law are recognized as social and economic rights, or technically rights, um, are not recognized here. And therefore, there's no basis in the way we think about health to imagine it as a right. And this is totally different from the Brazilian system, which I think the, is, is really one of the best examples of having a right to health in the Constitution that can then be used um, specifically um, to get access to care and to support access to care. Um, I don't, I, I think, I'm not sure if you're asking uh, about specifics of the data here, but I think there are the kinds of um, disparities in in many parts of health and not just infant mortality. Um, the supply side question and the quality issues, I think this is really key research that we are doing in um, Tanzania, for, for example, shows that it's actually the way women are treated in health facilities, including the kinds of issues that Cesar talked about, the, the kind of abusive treatment that is the single biggest reason for low utilization in people's view, as people say what their reason for not utilizing services, even more than uh, cost barriers. So quality both in the way one's treated, but in just, is there care there? Are there the supplies needed? Are there the, um, the health providers there who are supposed to be there? Are the drugs there, et cetera? Just really fundamental supply side issues, I think become key rights issues, as well as these questions of interpersonal relationships. So thank you for raising that. Okay, why don't we, Karen, come down here, Ron Waldman and Samia. Thanks, thanks, thanks um, Cesar and Lynn for tremendous presentations. I'm glad the cartoon's up there now. I think it says mm. more than uh, many of us could and, and better. Uh, you know, in this country, every time elections roll around, health care does become a very prominent issue. And in fact, in many of the polls, it's the most important issue to many of the people, at least the financing aspects of health care. And I think it would be interesting to hear from you whether um, there's data to suggest that poor people in the countries from which you're uh, deriving your data place a similar high value on health care. Do we know that they do, in fact? Um, I know that from some of my work and discussions that we've had with Lynn uh, regarding Lynn's um, uh, statement that um, better health systems would contribute to better citizenship and similarly better citizenship presumably to more legitimate governance, 
Um, you know, I, I don't know that there's evidence to say that strengthening health systems in those countries that are trying to institute democracies uh, really play an important role. I'm not saying that they don't. I'm saying only that we don't have, to my knowledge, the, the, the data to be able to support um, statements uh, like that. I wish we did. I'm a firm believer in the adage that what gets measured gets done. And I think that, uh, I know that there are studies maybe beginning now in countries like Liberia, hopefully Afghanistan, and a few others where, um, where the health systems have perhaps outperformed other sectors, yet we don't know that that's something that's really important to the population and particularly to the poor populations. When you do look at, uh, when you do talk to people in well-designed surveys and ask them what they want, they're looking at jobs. They're looking for better education. And health doesn't always figure as prominently in their responses uh, to questions regarding their priorities as it seems to during elections, at least in this country. If you could pass it to Samia. My name is Samia Altaf. I'm the Pakistan scholar at the Woodrow Wilson Center. I'm a public health physician, and I'm writing about aid effectiveness in the uh, health sector in Pakistan. Uh, thank you very much to both of you. This was uh, uh, very informative. Uh, I have a very small comment to make, uh, Lynn, and I must say I've read, I had read your work, and it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's an honor to hear you, hear you speak. Uh, I would add to that that in terms of the human rights uh, issue related to maternal health, um, you know, in, in countries like Pakistan and, of course, India also, and in some of the areas here in the United States, I worked for, for a while in California, one of, the, one of the reasons that poor women cite for not using institutional health care is the small humiliations that they suffer. So they'd actually say that, that it's not a question of not the doctor not uh, seeing you or you having to wait for a long time, but it's the small humiliations that you suffer at yeah. every step that actually are a barrier to health care. Um, so that was the comment I wanted to make. My question is for Cesar. Cesar, you mentioned um, the seven interventions which uh, are, are uh, part of the, um, uh, which have been shown to be very effective. And uh, you say that uh, they are very easy to do and they are e e available and, of course, you know, they are a human right, rights issue. And, of course, all of these interventions are very inexpensive and very easy to do. Have you looked at or, or, or thought about this issue that why is it that they are not done? Because those of us who have been involved in the public health sector for many years, you remember during the 80s, uh, the same interventions were were being implemented under the rubric of child survival uh, uh, activities. So the interventions remain the same. Surely they become more sophisticated, and policy makers and program planners, and of course, you know, uh, uh, well-respected researchers such as yourselves, continue to talk about them. But yet, if you look back the past 20 years, you find that it's still not getting to the stage where it's being done. So I'm wondering, have you thought about that? Why is it not done? I say that because I'm basically a physician, so physicians usually <laughs> like to reach a diagnosis. So, thank you. Okay, should we take those two? Okay, well, uh, I think they're both very good questions. I think for Ronnie, I don't have the... Yeah, I mean, we all like to say that if you invest in health, you're, incre you're improving human capital. And if you have better human capital, that is, people who are healthier, taller, because they don't suffer malnutrition, they have higher schooling because their brain, you know, I'm talking about children, their brain was not affected by undernutrition, they have higher income and so forth. So we have pretty good, we have pretty good amount of evidence, uh, which we recently reviewed a few months ago uh, from studies from all over the world, saying if you invest in young children's nutrition, up to the age of two years, you can make a lot of difference. They are taller adults, they go farther in school, they're more intelligent, they earn more. So there's quite a lot of evidence on that now. And we think that having a good health system is important for having good nutrition because you have advice on feeding and you have fewer infections and you know infections affect your growth. So if you have fewer infections, 
you have less malnutrition, you become healthier adults, so it will help for people in the end. So in the next generation, it will not only reach the poor, but it will reduce poverty. But that is a long chain of events, and we don't have that much direct evidence on that. We have evidence linking unhealthy childhood to, uh, un to low productivity in adults, but we don't have evidence saying that if you really do it well, you can make a, a big difference. Uh, we have some evidence from Guatemala, but they're basically giving food to kids, you know, feeding kids appropriate foods. You know, a big trial done in the 70s. The kids were in an adventuring group. It was a randomized trial. They are now taller. They're, they're more intelligent, and they earn 15% more than those in the control group. So it's very indirect. But, I mean, yeah, I mean, we have to wait a long time to do that trial. So <laughs> I, would act, I would be ready to act on this indirect evidence <laughs> so far. <laughs> Uh, a very good question, too, uh, about why these interventions are not done. And, well, number one, they are often not prioritized. Health is not a real priority in, in many governments. So if you know that if you give antibiotics, you can treat pneumonia, but the antibiotics are, there are stockouts of antibiotics. The government hasn't bought enough. Uh, it's, uh, and even some diseases are more, have higher priority than others, like the HIV antiretroviral uh, medicines are always available in Brazil. There's no shortage. There are very strong civil society arguing for the rights of uh, treatment. But the common antibiotic for pneumonia, they're often stock out. So different diseases get different priorities. So it's, I mean, it, it's a good question. Now, why do we have these interventions for such a long time, and yet they're failing to reach a lot of children? But on the other hand, I think with some of the examples I showed you, there are some countries that are doing well. You know, if you really have political will, and if you place health high in your policy agenda, you can get it. You can, you can make a difference. And there are several countries where you can see that. But still, unfortunately, these are a minority of countries. They're not the majority. I would... Responding to Ron, um, I'm surprised Cesar didn't mention Brazil, where I really understand the post-dictatorship, if you ask what people want. My understanding, you know, without much familiarity really with Brazil, is that when the dictatorship ended, the development of a health system with real people, participation, and engagement was a key part of the building of a democratic society in Brazil. And I think Cesar has shown us many of the um, effects for equity and poverty. So in my mind, Brazil might be a good example. And I think there are you know, we can find lots of studies in different places where people do prioritize health. I, there are some that, you know, women's groups do where women prioritize women's health as a major issue, um, often more than the things that development agencies are coming and giving them. But whether or not what you and I have talked about, whether or not for example, in a post-conflict setting where the health system has been totally demolished, whether it is you know, really the right approach to build the health system as a way of building a new society. You know, I, I, I hope that we now do develop the evidence that we really could answer that question. And just to respond to Samia, I mean, I think these, this question of the small humiliations, we see this over and over again, and it will be very interesting with this JSY scheme that I think has huge potential. But one question in the first year, many, many people are going, they're getting a payment, but they're, the, the quality and the, what they're getting when they go to the um, facility has been so uneven and mixed and sometimes poor and abusive that I think it will be very important to follow over time and to monitor, monitor, monitor to see if it really is going to address poverty, is going to address maternal mortality, or whether those small humiliations will actually sink the scheme despite the payment.
Thanks to both of you for a very insightful presentation. Um, I wanted to focus on uh, integrated maternal, newborn, and child health and the political economy of certain decisions uh, or let's say designs of large-scale programs. So if, if we take as examples the issue of delegation and also of uh, going beyond delivery to community mobilization and empowerment processes, what do you think are the key challenges in terms of evidence building for uh, addressing and incorporating these into designs of large-scale programs? Rachel, there are two in the middle there. Uh, John Fino, Research Triangle Institute. Just two points. First, of course, there's a political economy of health Politicians want to take credit and avoid blame, and it's much easier to take credit for cutting a ribbon to a hospital than taking credit on having enough um, pneumonia antibiotics, for instance, right? Or it's hard for the average citizen in any democracy, U.S., Brazil, a new democracy in sub-Saharan Africa, to identify who to blame for whatever problem they see in the health system. So designing political institutions that allow citizens to give voice to their concerns is a big problem in any democracy. That being said though, specifically to this talk, I'm just curious, given uh, Professor Victoria, your discussion of different health interventions, and given the Millennium Development Goals and all of the, and these other metrics, would we be better served looking at health, at health systems and having more of a focus, let's say, on fiscal resources and human resources? In other words, have much more systematic planning. For instance, we all know that sub-Saharan African countries have enormous human resource deficits, yet I don't know of any country seriously doing any planning at all to address them. So uh, I'm wondering if a systems approach, for lack of a better way of putting it, versus a more programmatic approach might be necessary. Okay. If you could hand that just right behind you, we'll take one more. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Bridget McHenry. I'm with the White Ribbon Alliance for Safe Motherhood, and I want to first um, acknowledge and thank the acknowledgement of maternal mortality as really the, the one indicator of health system functioning. Um, and it seems to me that there is more attention to this and your uh, little publicity for this evening's <laughs> broadcast I think highlights that. Um, but what I'm, I'm seeing and starting to hear is as a result of that there's now this talk about maybe forming a global fund for maternal health or to reduce maternal mortality. And I think this actually builds off of the previous question in terms of what your, your thoughts are about that and about whether that approach could be effective in the type of health system improvement needed to improve maternal mortality and what the, your sort of basic recommendations or cautions about that would be. Okay, well, um, to try to be brief, the key challenge is, I think the first question was community mobilization and integrated programs. I think one of the really big challenges is often when we talk about community mobilization, what we're talking about in fact, or what happens in practice is IEC or BCC, you know, um, information, education, communication that's designed to increase demand and get people to use services. I think we have to think about community mobilization as mobilizing people to be part of developing an accountability dynamic between the health system and the people it is meant to serve. And that you know, an IEC program is part of a demand side uh, intervention, but real accountability and real mobilization of a community to engage with the health system through, there are lots of different mechanisms, you know, hospital monitoring boards, public hearings, what, whatever the issue. I think that's the big challenge, to really make an accountability mechanism. Um, 
I totally agree that we need to address pieces of the health system, such as human resources, um, in a, spend much more time, energy, money, intellectual energy, uh, evidence building on these chunks of the health system. I mean, I personally, working in the maternal mortality field, for example, have come to the view that unless we think this way about human resources, the management of human resources, the development of human resources, the enabling environment, et cetera, we will never come anywhere close to the MDG. That thinking about it just as um, medical interventions rather than building blocks of the health system will never get us the kind of scale that's needed to reach, you know, to address people's needs and to really reduce maternal mortality. The Global Fund, um, you know, I think we really need to think about it as a possibility and to learn from um, the, the fund for AIDS, TB, and malaria, maybe some of the best practices. I mean, I haven't myself yet come to a, I know it's a becoming a bigger and bigger discussion, and I haven't myself yet come to what I think about it, because I also very much understand the importance of country ownership, of um, you know, really giving countries the the power and capacity to make good decisions with their citizens about how to address problems. And you know, I know that's the intention of direct budget support whether there's a way to structure a global fund to ensure that there is that kind of um, country ownership that's accountable to the people that I think is needed to really develop quality services. I think that's the challenge. So um, I'm glad we're having the discussion because it also implies that there's some money out there for maternal health. So I think it's one we need to undertake very carefully, but we need to consider. A couple of brief comments. I think it's interesting coming from a country perspective to see what happens in, uh, in the global arena where the donors and the rich countries and the funders basically dictate the rules. And what we see is uh, one issue that is the actual emphasis on magic bullets. You know, these interventions are magic bullets. I mean, they are damn good bullets, but they are but they are magic bullets. And what often happens is uh, bilateral agencies like USAID or Canadian CEDA or DFID uh, to a lesser extent or any others, they tend to want short-term results. And so it's easier to go for a magic bullet, deliver it in a more or less artificial way, and forget that you need a gun to deliver a bullet. I mean, the analogy is not very... Uh, good one, you know, I don't like the warlike analogy, but you need a, a health system with people and with facilities and everything to deliver those bullets constantly over time because, you know, you, you can get high coverage with, the, with a vertical intervention such as vitamin A or a vaccine or a bed net in a short term, but that will go away in a, sh in a few years. But we see this incredible pressure for quick results, for rapid mortality reductions that they can the, the, the donor agency can go back and, and report to their politicians and say, we, we saved so many lives, you know, we're great. And then they go on and the politicians take the credit, they don't get blamed and so forth. So there's a great tendency for that. That's one thing. And the other thing is the one size fits all uh, approach. Uh, IMCI, for example, which I use, was originally a one size fits all strategy. I mean, it didn't take into account that by training government doctors and health workers in a place like Bangladesh who reach in 10 or 15 percent of the whole market because there's a lot of private care out there. And, and it didn't take into account that the communities are very different in different parts. And the community component of IMCI was never really implemented. It was not even the IEC were saying is not enough, which is not, I fully agree. But that was not implemented properly 
because it just uh, ended up being concentrated on training health workers. And then you come into the issue of health resources. In Peru, 40% of the health workers they trained had left their job in two years. 40% in two years. So they had to keep training. And we did this calculation, and I calculated that it would take 42 years to train all the health workers in Peru, because given the, the rotation and turnover rate that they had in the country. So uh, I, the bottom line is the short-term emphasis of many donor international agencies is really not compatible with the long-term development of health systems that we need to make these changes permanent. So I, think, I thank you for the question. They're very uh, useful and, and thoughtful questions. I'm struck by how many times I've sat in this chair and on a range of different topics, this timeline and the expectation for quick and reportable and positive results and the lack of the longer time view and everybody recognizing that as a problem. I including it was being the original. In, in, well, no, no, <laughs> I, I wish. I wish it was just in this sector. And even often the recognition um, from the donors themselves uh, and kind of you can keep tracing it back to some of the appropriators and, and some of these, in many ways, political timelines that do us a tremendous disservice on what is a the kind of fundamental long-term enterprise of development across a range of different issue areas and such. Um, but it's good that you remind us of that because um, we, in this town, particularly need reminding of it. Um, I think uh, I will urge you all to kind of continue this conversation. We will have resources including PowerPoints and the video and such available on our websites. And I know there's rich um, kind of data and research available um, for both Cesar and, and Lynn's um, uh, home institutions as well. Um, I thought we had some outstanding questions here. And it's clear that there's a lot of interest in this topic. Um, I think the equity issues are so, uh, you, you've shown us why it's not only the right thing to do, but it's the smart thing to do to take these issues seriously and in a kind of very practical planning ways and uh, in human rights considerations ways, again, for the, for the right reasons and for the smart reasons. And so um, I thank you both for uh, very rich presentations and, and an excellent discussion. So please join me in thanking our guests for today's discussion.